<clears throat> okay, we are continuing our series today in the book of Romans, or the letters to the Romans. And uh, we're up to chapter 13, which is a very um, helpful uh, and practical uh, passage about our uh, understanding of the government and how we interact with the government as um, those who have been saved by Christ. So we're reading the first seven verses of Romans chapter 13. Uh, Hear the word of God. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, uh, you also pay taxes for the authorities and ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honour to whom honour is owed. Amen. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, know that uh, you call us to be transformed by uh, the renewal of our minds. And so we pray, Father, that as we listen to this part of, the, of your word, that you would do that uh, for us, Lord, that uh, how we think about uh, the world and the government and uh, our place in society, we pray, Father, that you would uh, reshape our minds so that we think uh, according to your will. Um, but we also pray that you would reshape our hearts, Lord, that we would have the desire to live according to your will uh, so that our lives might be for your glory and that we might be a light uh, in this dark world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Romans, as I've been uh, reminding you, I think um, nearly every week, uh, it's all about the gospel of God. That's the theme that Paul stated right at the start, the gospel of God. And what is the gospel? The gospel is that we're saved by the work of Jesus not by our own works. And ever since chapter 12, Paul has then been showing us how the gospel works out in our lives, how how it reshapes every aspect of us uh, so that we uh, live as people who have been saved by Jesus in the world, uh, as we offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. And last time we were in Romans, we looked at how the gospel shapes uh, the way we interact with each other uh, in the church but also how we interact with others outside the church, particularly those who are against the church. Well, today we're continuing that theme, uh, but this time we're looking at how does the gospel reshape our relationship to the government and to society uh, at large, or governing authorities, actually. Sorry. Uh, Now, for Paul's original readers, this was a huge issue because it's most likely that Paul wrote this letter in 57 AD, which was four years into the reign of of the Roman emperor named Nero. And I'm sure many of you have heard about Nero before, Uh, not the sort of emperor you'd want uh, in power as um, when you're a Christian, uh, because it meant that the the, the Christians under the Roman government were facing increased hostility. Okay, four years into Nero's reign, it wasn't as bad as it was going to become. And uh, we know from history that it became very, very bad. Uh, but you could imagine the sort of conversations that the Roman Christians would have been having 
in their church, um, over morning tea, you know, about the government, it's most likely that they were quite fearful. And so you could imagine the conversations, the, the distress in their voices as they talked about uh, what it's like to have Nero as your king. And they weren't in a democracy. They couldn't do anything to vote Nero out. Uh, and so what did the gospel have to offer them in the way that they related to their government? Now, obviously, we're in a much different context today. Uh, we don't have a, uh, a dictator. Well, maybe some people might think that, but we don't have a dictator uh, ruling over Australia. Uh, we're in a very different uh, form of government. And yet, what we'll see in this passage is that the implications of what Paul wrote in that first century they do directly apply to us because although we have a different form of government, we still have the fact of government. You know, we still live under governing authorities. And therefore, this passage will help us to think about how to relate to those governing authorities. And in particular, because this is in Romans, it will show us how the gospel shapes the way we interact with governing authorities. And when I say governing authorities, I'm talking about all aspects of government in this land. So everything from, uh, you know, uh, politicians to police to courts, uh, everything, you know, regulations about buildings, about health, about road use, uh, even, even things down to a local level, like, you know, there's regulations about your garden and about your pets, uh, even things like how you relate to governing authorities in schools and in workplaces. So yeah, this passage, it applies to all of those areas in how we think, how do we relate to uh, the government? Or how does the gospel reshape the way we interact with all of these um, governing authorities? And so that's what this passage is about. So let's look at it under three headings. Let's think about where do governing authorities come from? Then let's think about what are governing authorities for? So, you know, what is the government meant to be doing? And then thirdly, we'll think about how we're to live under um, governing authorities. So first, where do governing authorities come from? Well, what, what's the answer in this passage? What does verse 1 say? They come from God. See that? Uh, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So that, that couldn't be any more clearer. If there's a governing authority, God in his providence has put it there. Uh, another way to say that is the way God governs the world or the way God governs humanity is through governing authorities. And I don't know if you've ever stopped to um, think about that. Have you ever stopped to, to think about what a wonderful blessing it is to have government? Probably not, because that's not the Australian thing to do. We don't stop and go, oh, isn't um, politicians and government, isn't all that wonderful? We don't do that as Australians. But if we are listening to this passage, we realise that it is actually an aspect of God's goodness, that he gives governing authorities to a country so that there can be order and peace and stability. And we can see how good it is to have governing authorities if we just think for a moment what it would be like if there were no government. You know, imagine living in a country where there is no uh, uh, police, no rules, no regulations, no penalties, no courts. Okay, initially that sounds really fun. You can go and do whatever you like until you get run over by a speeding car or have all your, be <coughs> all your belongings stolen then you realise it would be terrible to have no government. It would be, it'd be impossible to live. It would be anarchy. Everyone just doing whatever they like, total chaos. And sadly, some places in the world are actually like that. Some, some countries, there is no government. There is, there's no stability as a result. And the only people that are happy living there are the ones with the biggest weapons. Everyone else is just living in fear, hiding. And I doubt that there's many of us here, probably, I'm not sure if there's any of us here who have ever lived in a place like that, where every day you're just fighting for survival. 
Instead, we live in a country where we have peace, where we have order, we have stability. And that is a wonderful blessing from God. We should be so grateful for the government that we have and we should be grateful to God because he is the one who has instituted them. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean we have to agree with everything that our government stands for, but it is just recognising that the fact of government is a gift of God. Do you know, that's something that um, Jesus acknowledged. Uh, even Jesus himself, even when he was on trial by the Roman government, and he said to the very governor who would order his execution, he said to Pilate, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. See, governing authorities comes from God. And even if it's not that great, it's, still, it's always better than having no governing authorities. Now, if governing authorities have been instituted by God, then, then how do we live under them? Well, part of our obedience to God is, as verse 1 says, to uh, submit uh, or to be subject to these authorities. And that's true uh, not just with the government, but, but with all, all authorities that God puts in place. Hey, God puts all kinds of authorities in place in our lives. Um, it's not because you know, those in authority are the, are the you know, more important or more valuable and those who, who are under authority are less valuable. It's just the way God has ordered society to work. Uh, to have order in society, there are those in authority and those in submission. It's the way God has ordered it. And in the context of Romans, when, we're, when we hear a, a command to submit to the authorities that God puts in place, that's actually one of the changes that the gospel brings to our lives. Uh, the gospel is that we, we used to be living in rebellion against God you know, the, the ultimate authority. And yet through the work of Christ, we are brought into a right relationship with God where we are now willingly submitting to the Lord and therefore we submit to all of the authorities that he um, puts in place over us. And we all have authorities over us, every single one of us. Uh, we all have to submit in more than one area of our lives. And uh, therefore, to follow Jesus is to live a life of submission, you know, even as he submitted himself to his father in his earthly life. And we actually can't follow Christ unless we are willing to submit to the authorities that God places over us. Uh, if you look at verse 2, you'll notice it says, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. And so God, God puts authorities in place. Our job is to submit to them. Now, that raises a whole heap of questions, such as what if the authorities are evil? What if the authorities are oppressive? What if the authorities, let's just imagine that our government decides to introduce all of these laws that make it almost impossible to live as a Christian. You know, what if the government one day bans Bibles or bans uh, going to church. Are we to submit, as the passage says? Is that, is that what this passage is saying? Is it saying that submission is absolute? That if there's an authority, you must absolutely submit in all times? Well, obviously not. Um, but before we think about any exception to this rule of submission, the first thing we need to do, we need to start where this passage starts. Where does this passage start? It starts by recognising that God puts authorities in place, that our underlying attitude must be one of a willingness to submit. And only when we have that in place, only then can we make wise decisions about what to do in exceptional circumstances or what the exceptions actually are. Uh, so what are the exceptions then? What are the qualifications to this um, submission? Well, the main one that's hinted at here is that all authorities that God puts in place, 
they must operate within the sphere within the sphere that he gives them. The authorities must not usurp God's authority. And you can see that it's hinted at in this statement in verse 1 again, that there is no authority except from God. And so that means if there's an authority telling you to do something that means you would have to disobey God, then what, what do you do as a response? You don't submit to that authority. Okay, it doesn't matter where that authority is, if it's in the home or if it's in uh, the church or in the state, if an authority is telling you to do something that would go against God's commands, then your role is to not submit to that authority in that situation. Because submission to God's authority always trumps submission to every other authority. And uh, there's, you know, that's a principle that we see right through the Bible. Uh, that's why I got uh, Matt to, uh, to read from Exodus chapter 1, where, remember that the Hebrew midwives, they were commanded by Pharaoh, who was the government, and he said to the, the Hebrew midwives that you kill every baby born to the Hebrew women. And, uh, and so, you know, you can imagine them there. Now they're under this tension. Do I submit to the government or do I do what's right and protect life? And they chose what was right. They did the right thing. They, did, they didn't submit to the government in that situation. Another example would be in Daniel 3 where you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, you know, they're told that they have to bow down and worship this big statue of the king. <clears throat> and what do they do? <clears throat> they respectfully disobey. They say to the king, you know, we can't do that. We're not going to do that. And so they got thrown into a fire. <laughs> God, God looked after them, but there's consequences to this. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7, you know, Daniel himself was faced with a similar situation. The government said, no more prayer unless you're praying to uh, the God of the Babylonians and so what did Daniel do? He went up, just continued as normal, praying to the Lord. And he was thrown into the lion's den. Again, God looked after him. But again, we see there's consequences to this. Uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter and John, they're told by the rulers uh, that you are not allowed to preach the gospel. Okay, They banned the preaching of the gospel. And Peter and John said to them, we must obey God rather than men. And so we can see, you know, when you look through the Bible, we see that the government's authority, it comes from God, but it's not absolute. Okay, God's authority is always higher. God's authority always trumps uh, every other authority. And therefore, if the state commands us to do something that God forbids, or if the state forbids something that God commands, then our duty is actually civil disobedience. And at this stage in Australia, there are some very limited cases where you might have to do that. And maybe that will become more common in the future. But if that's the case, we actually have to be prepared to, to deal with the consequences. Okay, Civil disobedience is not something that you rush into thinking, yeah, we get to do this, uh, you know, this great stand and stuff. No, you've got to think about it. There are consequences to this. And we need to be prepared to deal with it, to, to have those consequences, because obeying God always comes first. But for the most part, we live in a time where that is not something we have to daily grapple with, and therefore we should be very grateful for that. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that when it talks about submission to the government, that doesn't rule out working to change the government. Okay, uh, A good example of this would be in the book of Esther where, uh, remember, the government ordered the extermination of all the Jews. And so what did Queen Esther do? She did everything in her power, even at the risk of her own life, to overturn the government's ruling. And see, we live in a country where there are laws that are wrong. You know, laws about the killing of unborn people. And so what do we do as Christians? 
we want to see those laws overturned. And so it's a good thing to write to politicians. It's a good thing to take our place in, in lawful protests. See, overturning government laws is a good thing to do. It's, it's also part of what it means to be a Christian, living in a country, living in a society. But apart from those qualifications, what is our role? It's to submit to the governing authorities that God puts over us. Because the gospel, remember, the gospel is the good news that's turned us. We used to be rebels, rebels of God. Now we're citizens of heaven. And as citizens of heaven, we obey the king of heaven and all of the authorities that he puts over us. So that's the first thing. Governing authorities are instituted by um, God. Now, the second thing we uh, see in this passage is what governing authorities are are for. Uh, What are they for? Well, look at verses 3 to 5. Uh, And in these verses, you'll notice that Paul makes the case that the role of the government is to be servants of God who serve the citizens of the the state. And you'll notice in verse 4, twice Paul calls those those in government servants of God. And what's interesting about that is that it's the very same word that he uses to talk about servants in the church. It's actually the word for a deacon. And it it comes out even more down in verse 6 where Paul calls uh, the authorities ministers of God. And the word Paul uses for ministers of God, it's the same word that he uses to describe himself as a minister of the gospel later on in this letter. And so you can see that, you know, God in his province, he puts these government people in place And those who serve in the government are actually serving God, whether they realise that or not, whether they like that or not. (laughs) They're actually serving God. And not only that, but they're also serving us as uh, members of society. And we can see in these verses that the government has two, two roles in society, a primary role and a secondary role. Now, the primary role is uh, in verse 4, and that is the, the, the role of the government is to maintain order in society by punishing wrongdoing. So look at verse 4. It says that the government, um, halfway through verse 4, he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So he, here's the original avengers, not the ones in the movie. Uh, carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now, when we hear all this language, it actually reminds us of the passage we looked at two weeks ago. Because two weeks ago, we looked at that passage on how we should act when someone mistreats us. You know, we're not to go out and seek revenge. Rather, we're to leave that to God. Uh, Chapter uh, 12, verse 19, if you look back at that, It says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it's written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And we know that that verse is talking about uh, how one day God has a a day set called Judgment Day, and on that day all of the wrongs that have been done will be put right. God will repay all evil uh, with judgment. But then when we get to chapter 13, we realise that until that day happens, God carries out his judgement in a temporal way through the governing authorities. Verse 4 says that the government is an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoing. Now, that's not a replacement for judgement day, and uh, governments don't always get that right. You know, the the government doesn't know everything. It can't deal with every bit of wrongdoing. But this is God's appointed means of bringing justice into this fallen world before the day of justice. So this is how God carries out his, his judgment in a temporary way until that last day. And when a government does that, like if we live in a country where the government has good law systems and and courts 
and uh, where justice is you know, a normal function in society, then what happens? The whole society benefits. Okay? Life is better in the country. So that's the primary role that governments have, to, to punish wrongdoing. Uh, the secondary responsibility is uh, back in verse 3, and here we see it's to promote good behaviour. The government's role is to promote good behaviour. So verse 3 says, Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. Now what these verses are saying is that when a government is functioning well, they are a government who promotes or enacts policies that promote good behaviour, uh, enact policies that's, that normalise good behaviour. And just to give you one example of that, just think about um, road rules, you know, s- speed limits. Okay, sometimes we, we look at speed limit signs and we think those things are annoying because they slow us down, we've got somewhere to get to, and uh, we should be able to go faster than, than what the limit says. But what is the purpose of the speed limit? It's to normalise good behaviour. See, it normalises people driving uh, in, a, in a safe manner. And so that's, that's one of the roles of the government, to, to enact policies like speed limits that normalise good behaviour. And again, when a government does that well, everyone in this society benefits and uh, therefore, if, if that's the government's role, to maintain order by punishing wrongdoing and promoting uh, good behaviour, then Paul goes on to make the application that if you want to, generally speaking, if you want to live a happy life, you know, if you don't want to be uh, worried about getting into trouble, then it's actually very simple. Just obey the government, obey the laws. You know, if you don't want a speeding fine, it's easy. Stick to the speed limit. Uh, If you own a business and you don't want WorkSafe coming in and hassling you all the time, all you've got to do is do things by the book and everything will be fine. Uh, (laughs) What this passage is saying is we shouldn't be the kind of people who are always looking over our shoulder, always worried about getting caught because now we're always pushing the boundaries on, on things. Uh, that's actually not the mindset God wants us to live by. And uh, verse 5 actually sums it up by saying that, that we have two reasons why we should actually obey the government in these ways. It says uh, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And so here we see we, the reason we obey is because, number one, we don't want to get in trouble, but more than that, it's because of conscience. And what is conscience? Conscience means that we obey even if there are no consequences. Okay, because we realise the one who has put the government in place, we want to obey God. So even if no one is looking at us, even if there's no uh, consequences, we still do what is right out of conscience. And so there you go. What's the, where does the government come from? It comes from God. What is it for? To maintain order by punishing wrongdoing and promoting good behaviour. Now, the third thing this passage tells us then is uh, how we live under government. And we've already covered this to to some degree by talking about submission. But in verses 6 and 7, Paul, he unpacks this in a more practical way. Now, what does it look like to live in submission to the government? Well, listen to verse 6 and 7. It says, Because of this you also pay taxes for the authorities and ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom uh, taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honour to whom honour is owed. Now notice how Paul puts all of this into the category of what is owed. And when you think about all the things that government provides in a society, uh, when you think about everything that it takes to keep a society ordered and functioning. You realise that there's a lot going on, a lot of stuff 
that we all benefit from. And all of the things that it takes to keep society functioning costs a lot of money, which means paying taxes is part of living in a country. It's, it's not something to, to moan about. It's just a reality. It's, it's how things work. It's how we get to enjoy living in a place where, you know, we have many good things like um, smooth roads and hospitals and uh, places where you can go and get educated uh, and law enforcement. You know, the fact that we can, we know that there's somewhere you can turn to when something goes wrong. Okay, that's all provided by the government. It's all good, but it all costs money. And therefore, to be a member of society, we need to pay taxes, which means that paying taxes is a good thing. We don't moan about it. We just do it. Uh, but maybe the biggest challenge for us uh, from these verses is actually the attitude that is owed. Because what, what's the attitude? Notice respect and honour. And when you hear that, you realise that our Australian outlook really is on a a head-on collision with the Christian outlook. Because in Australia, it's, it's almost a virtue to, to, you know, to run down those, you know, those idiots in Parliament. Um, it can be the way we talk about them. And especially when it's not our preferred party who are calling the shots, you know, we can say all these kind of things about them. <clears throat> but what does this say? It says we, we owe respect to whom respect is owed and honour to whom honour is owed. Now, sometimes we can think that we, we should only respect someone if they have all the same views as us, you know, if they have all the same values as us. But Paul doesn't put that qualification on this verse. And it's not because he was writing to Christians who lived under a government that was perfect. <laughs> far from it. They lived under a government that was far more immoral and far more hostile to Christians than what we have today. And so the attitude that says, I'm not going to respect a political party if they don't agree with the things I agree with, that's actually not a biblical attitude. Now, that, that's not saying we can't say, you know, this and that's wrong. It doesn't mean we can't point out the, the things that the government are getting wrong. But when we do that, we're to do that with respect and honour, recognising <clears throat> that these, these are servants of God. Okay, ministers of God, that's what the passage says. And so we're to talk about them with that in mind, with the respect and honour that is owed to them, that we owe to them. Uh, <clears throat> 1 Timothy 2 uh, verses 1 to 2 uh, adds that we ought to pray for them. Okay, and, and I don't know about you, but it's, it's very hard to pray for someone who um, you're constantly running down or think you're a total joke. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so this is actually very helpful to us as, as well because, you know, sometimes when we talk about the government, it just sounds like we've just got an axe to grind or, um, you, know, you know, the big angry rants against the government. Who does that convince? No one but ourselves. Okay, but if we take hold of what this passage is saying and realise God has put these authorities in place, our role is to submit and to pay what we owe including respect and honour, then if we embrace all that, that actually enables us to speak into political issues in a helpful way. You know, not, in, not in an angry rant, not in a, a whole heap of criticism, but in helpful ways. And so this is a helpful passage for us uh, to apply. Um, but what we see here, the most important thing is to realise that submitting to governing authorities is actually a mark of someone who has been brought back into a right relationship with God. Because like I've been saying all the way through, the gospel is that we were once rebels, okay, rebelling against God, and yet he sent his own son into the world who went to the cross to pay for all of our rebellion so that we can be reconciled to God. And as a result, we now are members of a kingdom that endures forever. And because of that, because we've been saved by Christ in that way, then the fruit of that will be willing submission to God. And that heart attitude to God, to his authority, that then shapes the way we relate to every other authority that God puts over us. And so that means that as 
as Christians, we should actually be the best citizens in society. We should be those who obey from the heart. Now, not just out of fear of <clears throat> a, um, a fine, but we obey because we obey God. Uh, we should not be known for rebellion. We, we should not be associated with political ideologies that are all about rebellion. That has no place in a Christian life. Uh, nor, <clears throat> nor are we those who just do, <clears throat> sorry, just do whatever <clears throat> the government says no matter what, right? Because our ultimate allegiance is not to the government, it's to Christ himself. And so for some of you, maybe the main application from this passage is to actually have a higher opinion of the government, to realise that they are servants of God for your good. Okay, maybe one of the main applications is for the first time you're going to go home and thank God for the government that he's given us and the order and civility that we have. But for others, maybe the main application will be to lower your opinion of the government, to realise that the government is not the saviour. The government are not going to fix every problem in the world or in this country. You know, no political party can bring the kingdom of God to earth. Only Jesus can do that. And so Christians are those who neither despise the government nor worship the government, but those who are of conscientious submission to the government. And that's the bottom line. <clears throat> because we submit to Christ and therefore we submit to every legitimate authority that he puts over us. Well, may God enable us to do that to his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so uh, thankful uh, that you um, have put uh, governing authorities over us uh, because we know, Lord, that without them we're, that things would be uh, anarchy. And we thank you, Lord, that we live in a country that has uh, a long history of, of stable government. And uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, we have uh, so many good things <clears throat> that we enjoy in this land because of, ultimately because of your goodness and uh, your providence. And so, Lord, may uh, we be those who are deeply grateful uh, to live in this country and deeply uh, respectful to those that you have put over us. Um, but, Lord, we also pray for wisdom because there are issues that uh, we do need to navigate with wisdom from above. Uh, so may you give that to us, Lord, and help us to be uh, wise in how we think about different policies and how we uh, live in uh, certain aspects of society. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that in this country that uh, where there is a push to, to have uh, less Christian influence, we pray, Lord, that you would um, overturn that. Uh, we do pray, Father, that where there are laws that are contrary to your will, like uh, the killing of unborn children, we pray, Father, that those things would be overturned and that you would raise up men and women uh, in, uh, in politics who can uh, speak persuasively on these issues. Uh, but, Lord, we know that ultimately this, this earth, it's never going to be the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's only, only when Jesus returns will we have the ultimate true government, the, the, the place of real peace and of everlasting stability. And so, Father, help us to uh, recognise that only Christ is the true King and only under his rule can we be truly at peace. And so we pray, Father, for many in this country who are still living in rebellion against Christ, we pray that uh, the good news would come to them and that they would find uh, peace in him. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.